get started and then as people join then um yeah if everybody can just i'm i'm allowing everybody to talk but if you can just uh stay on mute until we get to like discussion points that way there we don't have a lot of background noise and stuff like that um so, okay, so um, today we will have um, Leo Luna on with us. Uh, he's going to go over a little bit of Facebook stuff. Um, today we're going to focus on um, some ways to get some listings. Um, I just picked out basically three. Um, we should head off to 15. Hold on, we're good. A little bit of feedback. You want, you want to go to the fishing? Don't be long. Okay, I found it. Okay, so um, three ways that uh, some listing agents are getting listings. I know you know you guys may see a lot of the same names out there all the time, so we're going to go over some of that. Next week, um, I might dive into um, a couple more uh, unorthodox ways of getting some listings, but um, I thought that this is a really good topic for right now because uh, that's something obviously that we all want uh, with the shortage of them out there. So hopefully this will help uh, get the wheels turning as to um, how to how to get some more listings. And then we'll also touch on um, some ways that I'm seeing um, some of our agents get their offers accepted. Um, I know it's challenging, especially in you know some markets more than others. Uh, to get offers accepted. So um, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit as we go. So um, if for some reason you guys can't see my screen or something like that, just, you know, pipe in or something and let me know. So um, I will send this doc out um, with a replay and because um, it does have a couple links in here in case you want to, um, you know, visit any of these that we talk about. So um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the sphere of influence. Um, this is always the best way to get your listings. Um, I'm guilty of it. Everybody's guilty of it. You know, not keeping in contact as good as we should um, with our sphere of influence, not just past clients, but, um, you know, friends, family, acquaintances, um, if you're part of any groups, you know, just staying in contact with these people a little bit better. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be with social media. Some of you maybe are really good on the phone. You prefer to make phone calls, things like that. It's just making a conscious effort every week to uh, be in front of these people, show them that you're out in the, in the, uh, in the field working, because um, that's what they want to see. You know, they, they do want to work with someone who is, um, you know, out there selling homes, you know, giving them information about the market, so on and so forth. So it, it is good to um, make sure you're doing that on at least a weekly basis. Um, so um, the best way to do that is by using a CRM, um, which is a content, uh, I call it a, you know, it, it's a customer relationship manager is what it is. Um, I call it a contact management system. Um, we do have one here at the company. Um, almost everybody has an account with agent marketing. Um, so if you haven't utilized that, um, be sure to go in there, activate your account. If you need access to it again, let me know. But this is connected with all of the marketing materials um, that you can put out through this system, but it's very easy to manage this. It's a simple, um, yeah, what's that? Basically, you just put in some, some information and press save. They have built-in um, email campaigns to stay in front of everybody. They also have a monthly newsletter. Um, this person is unsubscribed, but you can click uh, either on or off and they generate the monthly newsletter for you. You don't have to do anything. It's all automated and it will at least get you out in front of your clients once a month. Um, if you're, you know, if you don't have any other thing going on to stay in front of them. So, you know, utilize this system. Um, if you don't have a contact management system and you want to start using one, it's a pretty simple one. 
I like the task manager in here because after you talk to somebody, you can task yourself to follow up with them on another day. Maybe they want to talk to you in a couple of weeks or something. Um, maybe you're talking to a seller lead that you met and they said, hey, I'm not quite ready yet. Give me a call in a month. You can task yourself here so that you don't forget to do that. Um, follow up is where most agents kind of fall flat um, in converting leads because um, leads really aren't that hard to generate in general. It's the follow up portion. So um, if you don't want to use the, um, the company system, I did put together a few here that um, have good reviews. They're either free or very, very inexpensive. Um, and you can put together, you, you know, put all your contacts in there and um, start getting them on an email drip campaign or something like that so you can stay in front of them. Um, best practices, you know, just don't put a name and phone number. Put as much information as you have, you know, birthdays, when they bought their house, so on and so forth, so that you can start sending them, um, you know, so you have reminders of ways to touch them. You know, is it their birthday? Wish them a happy birthday. Is it the anniversary of the day they bought their home? Maybe a CMA report is a good thing to send them uh, to show them how much value they've got uh, over the past year. I mean, everybody's values have gone up so much, you know, so um, use the CRM. It'll make a world of difference to your business. Um, if you need to re-engage your uh, sphere of influence, there's plenty of ways to do it. You can do it through the SOI. This is a good sample I found. Um, it's a little small, but um, basically, you know, this was a response to a post that someone had put it on LinkedIn. He said, hey, I saw your post. It's been a long time since we chatted. I'm sure you've heard about what's going on in the market you know, and kind of take it from there. So there's a lot of different lead-ins you can use to re-engage your sphere of influence and uh, start asking them for business basically and showing them that you're out there in the field doing stuff. So um, if you want to challenge yourself, you know, reach out to 25 people a week. I think that's a very easy number. It's five a day, um, put them into your CRM, Go through your phone contacts. I'm sure everybody has hundreds and hundreds of contacts in there. I don't even know how many I have, probably a thousand. Um, and just start reaching out to people and reconnecting, you know. Um, that's going to be a, a free way to start getting some listings and other business. Um, or it's a very low cost if you're going to start doing any kind of marketing to your sphere of influence. Um, the next way is something that I really like. Um, it's leveraging your current buyers that you have to create listing inventory. And you can do it by uh, basically doing circle prospecting, if you've ever heard of circle prospecting. So um, I do have, um, you know, what circle prospecting means. It's a lead generation and marketing strategy that relies on the premise that homeowners who live nearby your recently listed or closed home want to know about it. So we all know what neighborhood our buyers are looking for. Um, we all have access to uh, title reps and, and information these days to get contact information. Um, these are how a lot of agents are getting listings. Um, they're double ending. They're, they're just matching up buyers with properties by simply going into these neighborhoods and uh, asking these sellers if they want to sell their home. So they are these homeowners if they want to sell their home. Um, I'm sure everybody's getting calls. I know all my friends are getting calls weekly from realtors out there just being super aggressive with trying to find listings. And one of their lead-ins is, hey, I have a buyer looking in this neighborhood. Are you interested in selling? Let's say it's a very easy lead-in. You can do a mailer, you can do phone and email if you can get that contact information. You can drop by a letter. Um, I do have a sample of one of those as well. Um, so some best practices, yes. Call up your favorite title company, say, hey, you know, I want all the, the homes 
in you know a radius around this particular house that are 2,000 square foot or larger and have owned the home for more than three years. And they will be able to narrow down that list for you. And um, some of them can get you the contact information. Sometimes you have to pay a little bit. Um, it could be 10 cents a contact or something. It's, it's, it's really quite affordable. And basically start matching up your buyers to potential sellers. Uh, the other bonus with that is you're not gonna have to deal with multiple offers. So you're just kind of sliding right in and um, potentially representing both sides, but um, it'll be much easier. Your buyers are gonna love you for it and you'll be creating your own inventory this way. Um, some other things you can do is performing CMAs uh, for some of your past clients. Uh, maybe you have past seller leads that are just kind of, you know, they haven't decided on what they want to do yet. Um, you can drop them off, you can mail them. Um, there's different ways of delivery for that. Um, sending buyer letters. Um, I actually, I, um, received one of those, one of my friends who actually listed their home with me received a letter from another real estate agent. Exactly that say, Hey, I have these buyers. We want to buy your home. Um, they've been looking at this area for a while. And, um, unfortunately that one didn't work out because those, my sellers were asking a higher price than what they were willing to pay for the home. But it's happening out there. So um, keep that in mind as an option for creating some more listings for yourself. Um, with COVID being a hot topic, still um, think about ways to approach people who maybe are nervous about listing their home because they don't want caravans of people coming through. Uh, so matching up a buyer could be music to their ears where they just have to deal with one buyer, they're gonna get a great price, and they don't have to deal with leaving their home for the entire weekend and having, you know, literally hundreds of people come through their home. Um, so that could be a good talking point. It could be a good marketing point for you um, if you're going to be uh, trying to solicit listings this way. Um, these are concerns about finding a replacement property. That is also a hot topic is, hey, I want to I want to cash out. I want to sell my home but I'm afraid that I'm not gonna be able to find another home. So, you know, how, how can I do this and how can you ensure that I'm not gonna be left without a home? So um, talk to them about having proper contingencies in place. Talk to them about actively hitting the pavement and seeking a home in a neighborhood that they would want to move to, um, you know, Think about that as you go. So here's here's a home letter I, I found. Um, again, I'm going to send this out to everybody. So if you want to, you know, don't reinvent the wheel here. But this is a letter that um, another real estate team is using um, to uh, solicit homeowners to see if they want to sell. Um, and you notice here at the bottom, they said delivered with no contact care and sanitized gloves. So you know they touched on you know, people being sensitive with, with COVID, uh, they may have just delivered this in a, maybe a manila envelope, or um, you can do it in a door hanger, you can do it, you know, set it down somewhere, um, you can mail it, there's a lot of different ways that you can send something like this out. So um, I'm going to leave you with this sample after the, uh, after the meeting. So um, from here, we'll let uh, Leo talk about some uh, utilizing Facebook marketing to target potential sellers. Leo, you want to take Yeah, over? hi there, Travis. Yeah, thank you. So just going to talk about this real quick, not going to dwell too deep into it because you can get pretty down this, pretty deep down this wormhole. Um, but I just wanted to kind of share with you some of the strategies um, that are out there to use Facebook ads, and that's gonna give you the best fighting chance when competing with other realtors out there. Because what I've, what I've seen, honestly, personally, is they, they throw up a messenger ad and it just goes straight to the inbox and there's no, there's really no uh, automated follow-up. It's, you know, someone puts in their data, their information, they start a conversation, however it is, and there's no follow-up um, right away. 
they just kind of leave it and maybe five hours, four hours, six hours, maybe even the next day they reach out to you. But by then your average lead is already going to move on um, because they're just getting bombarded um, with Facebook ads all day. And they're going to go on to someone that's going to respond a lot quicker. So going into that with that mindset, um, we're going to look at Facebook ads in different um, in different ways that Facebook allows you to advertise. So one of the best ways that we found that works is actually using um, Facebook. Well, first of all, Facebook's going to get you in front of the right people. Um, we have had a lot of, uh, before we used to be able to target by zip code, um, age ranges, demographics, um, all this huge parameters full of what we can select. Now we've really honed it in to be more equal opportunity, you know, not target zip codes, but we can target um, within a 15 mile radius of a location that's pinned. Um, so at least we get that on our side. Um, one of the other great things about Facebook is we can still target by um, by interest. You know, are they looking for a mortgage loan? Are they looking for, uh, are they a first time home buyer interest? Um, there's certain interests we can look up. You know, are they searching Zillow? Are they searching Trulia? Um, where are they, what are their habits looking like? Um, so we are able to target potential leads and get in front of the right people that way. Um, so one of the best ways is actually lead ads and messenger ads. Uh, lead ads is uh, a form on Facebook that people, when they see their ad, they click on it, they go straight to a pop-up window within Facebook, and then they auto pop or Facebook auto populates the information, the name, the email, and the phone number. So that way the potential lead doesn't have to fill out that information themselves. And all that information is straight from Facebook. So whatever that person uses Facebook to log into is what they're gonna have as their email. Now they can change it to whatever email they want it to be um, because they could have a preferred email. But for the most part, that's straight straight to the source is gonna be the lead ad um, and ge Facebook generates that. So that's what's really cool about lead ads. Um, you don't have to worry about the lead being, you know, is this a good email or is this a good phone number? Chances are it's it's a pretty effective way to capture that, that data. And then messenger ads, that's that's a great way to create the conversations because you know how important it is to have conversations in your business and creating messenger ads is a way for them to go straight into your inbox. Now, what people don't realize is that you can automate this and make it where they are chatting with someone that's a message like the chatbot. And depending on how you structure your ad, um, you can have that person interact with the chatbot and capture that lead a lot quicker um, and make it very seamless and easy and then it transfers into your CRM, whether you're using a Google Sheet, um, if you're using active or um, agency, um, Mark, I forgot the name of it, <laughs> or you're, you're using another type of CRM, um, you're gonna be able to capture that data and plug them into your automations. So that's really cool about messenger ads. Um, and then there's a third way that people don't really utilize, um, and that's video ads. You know, using video ads to create your ad, you know, have the person get to know, like, and trust you. That's a great way to get people to really just know who you are in the first place. You're not going to close a sale on the first transaction. Um, it takes around six to seven, you know, touch points for them to feel comfortable with you. So video ads is a great way to at least get the introduction going. And then with Facebook, it's actually a lot cheaper to run video ads. You can get video ads going pretty quickly, um, get your name out there for very low cost. Facebook will push videos more than actual images. And then what you do with those video ads, you actually create an audience out of that, people that watch your video a certain amount of time. And then you can retarget those people to invite them to opt into something, which is a lot higher rate of opt-in. Um, when you're using a video ad and then you're retargeting with videos. So keep that in mind as well. And then, um, so that's the three different ad categories. You know, like I said, we can go into the, the wormhole on each one of those categories, but that's just kind of a broad overview. And based on what I've seen in the market, you know, messenger ads by far with paired up with the correct messenger bot, you can get at least two to three consistent leads a day uh, when structured right. And, you know, if you have a good compelling offer, it, it's kind of the no brainer situation of someone getting information, getting in contact with you and, you know, then you capture them as your lead. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I have real quick. I don't want to dive too far into this. Um, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to message me, um, you know, and we can talk about this more, you know, figure out what ads, um, 
are more what you would like to see. Um, and we can go from there. But I just wanted to kind of give you a broad mm -hmm. overview of how you can capture those leads. Yeah, and these, these definitely work. I mean, as we we're doing this webinar, um, we actually had a lead come in um, that, that Leo put together um, and they went through the whole bot sequence. And, you know, I mean, we, we get these uh, daily. So this is definitely uh, something that works. It's very affordable. You know, it could be as low as, you know, $2, $3, you know, a click on these ads. So um, it's a great way to get in front of, uh, new potential clients um, and getting your name out there as well. Um, we'll have Leo on like quite a bit and we can start going into, um, you know, YouTube and, and maximizing that and videos and, and different things there too. So that, you know, if, if you want to do some of this on your own, um, we will start training on, um, you know, a lot of different things that you could be doing social media wise. That's, that's, you know, Leo's specialty on uh, being able to uh, generate more business um, for a very low cost or, you know, sometimes free, just depending on what your offer is and how you put it together. So um, we'll be doing those in the upcoming weeks. So um, to round out the meeting, I just wanted to um, go over a few best practices for getting your offer accepted. I know, you know, like I said, it's very challenging market. Um, I talk to a lot of you almost daily on fine tuning offers and different things like that. So just wanted to kind of put all, all that together um, to, you know, maybe help you with getting offers accepted if you're going up against, you know, 10, 12 different offers. So this is stuff that works for me. It works for other agents that I'm talking to. Um, so number one, uh, I like to always try and build a rapport with the listing agent from the time I contact them from showing. Um, I wanna be professional each time. I want to show up for my appointment on time. I read the MLS remarks. I mean, this is this is actually a huge one. You don't really think it is, but they, they have a specific um, reason why they're doing the showings the way they are and accepting offers the way they are. It's because they're getting inundated with calls, um, calls and emails and texts and everything else. So they're trying to streamline their way of showing. So be sure to read the MLS remarks and follow them so that you can get on their good side. You know, this is, this is your chance for a first impression. So get on their good side from the get go. Um, I know when I, when I have a listing and the agents don't read the, the MLS remarks, I'm getting these calls and that's literally what I text back is, hey, read the MLS remarks, please. You know, and I already am a little bit irritated with them. So don't be that agent. Read the, read the, the MLS remarks and, and follows for the showings. Um, try and stay in communication with the listing agent from the first time you're scheduling until uh, you decide to present the offer. Um, try and talk over the phone at least once so you can build a little bit of a connection there. Um, just texting and emailing doesn't always... Um, get your point across as good as it should. So um, maybe at least one phone call if they're willing to take a call um, to kind of introduce yourself, talk about your buyer a little bit, see what the seller needs are um, and, and take the conversation from there. Um, have the lender also reach out. Um, have them, you know, ease any concerns they have about your buyer. Um, if it's a lender you're working with, uh, repeatedly, um, that's something that listing agents like to hear too. Hey, I work with this a, this uh, this lender all the time. Um, we close a lot of deals. You know, we have 100% success rate. Something like that. You know, they they want to know that uh, your team is able to close the deal. Um, it's not always about the highest price. Um, sometimes it is about the listing agent feeling comfortable that they're not going to have to put this house back on the market again. Uh, because your buyer can't perform or because your buyer gets cold feet or something like that. Um, number two, so find out what the seller needs most aside from the highest offer. Um, add that to your offer up front. Do they need a rent back? Um, can your buyers offer this rent back period for free to the seller? You know, I mean, 
more than likely the buyer is not going to have a payment for the first 30 days. So maybe this is something that you can build into the offer if, if the seller needs a, a month or a two month rent back or something like that, or even just a couple of weeks, maybe you can offer that for free. That might be a good kicker for them choosing your offer over another competing offer that wants to charge the seller for the rent back. Um, do they need a few extra days? Maybe, maybe they don't need a full rent back. Maybe they just need, you know, two or three days to be able to move out, but they need their money first, you know, try and offer that, um, without a, without a cost as well, you know, talk to your buyers about this. Um, do they need a fast escrow? Do they need a longer escrow? You know, really figure out what the seller's needs are and build that into your offer. Um, so that you can make it as clean as possible. Um, I try and write the offer in hopes that I'm not gonna get a counter offer. Um, obviously we're gonna get a seller multiple counter offer in these situations, but I try and put as much as I can that's gonna entice them to not counter offer me on a bunch of little points. So, you know, make it as clean as possible, reduce your contingency timeframes, um, you can waive some if you're, you know, the ones that your buyer doesn't need, if they're paying cash, stuff like that. Um, put your, uh, you know, the, the 17 day, move that down to, you know, eight or nine or 10 days. We can all get an inspector out there within a week or two or a week or 10 days. So, you know, the 17 days is kind of, I've always thought it was a long, a long time. Um, and the seller doesn't want to keep their home off the market for 17 days. Uh, in limbo, wondering if the buyer is going to move forward. So if you can knock that out as quick as possible, um, that is enticing for the seller and the listing agent both. Um, if you can offer large amounts of earnest money, do so. You know, the earnest money is protected so long as you're fulfilling the contract. So um, try and offer more than 1% if you can, uh, or if your buyer can, to make it a stronger offer. Um, if, you're, if your buyer doesn't need any concessions, don't put them in there. You know, don't, don't, don't feel around to see if the seller, you know, will take it. Just don't even put it in there in this kind of market right now. Um, I talk about this a lot, presentation's important. You know, when you're doing your offer, fill in all the areas of the offer, including the listing agent contact information. All of that is in the MLS. Um, so you fill it out completely, make sure it's fully signed, uh, make sure you attach all your addendums, your pre-approval letters, your proof of funds, you know, generate a nice email, make a good subject line, you know, make a professional presentation of your offer because it's a reflection of your business and how you conduct it. Um, I don't like to be the first offer. Um, if, if they say that, Hey, we're doing showing Saturday, Sunday, and we're going to submit offers on Monday. Well, I'm going to submit offers probably on Monday. If they're doing Monday evening, again, I'm keeping in contact with them the entire time. So I have a good idea of when they're going to be presenting. So I don't want them to use my offer as leverage to entice other offers to offer more. So, um, and during that time, sometimes you can get some additional intel as to how high the offers are. So then you can write your offer accordingly. So um, that's something that I do personally, um, is I don't like to be the first offer unless they are going to be presenting offers as they come in. I'm having that communication with the listing agent and they're like, hey, we just want to get this thing on and off the market as quick as possible. Then I'm coming in, um, you know, as strong as I can with my offer right then and there to try and lock it up before they start getting at their offers. So again, communication is key. Um, be in contact with them and learning when they are going to present the offers and then, you know, uh, time in accordingly. Um, don't forget to talk about your team a little bit, you and your team. I'm not talking about gloating or bragging. Um, they don't care how long you've been in the business or the price point of homes that you typically work with. Um, that's a bit of a turnoff to an agent when you're doing that, but do talk about, you know, your lender partner, um, you know, your TC, how you do business, how you communicate, how often you give updates, things like that. You know, that's stuff that I like to hear as a listing agent. 
is how am I going to have to chase this buyer's agent down all the time to get updates? Or are they going to, you know, stay in communication with me, you know, because I want to work with someone like that. And I'm going to uh, express that to my seller when I present offers. If there's two or three that are very similar, I'm going to say, hey, this agent's really been in contact with me a lot. I talked to the lender. Buyer sounds really solid. I feel good about this one. Um, over the other two, you know, those agents just kind of, you know, send an email over and I haven't heard from them since. Um, so, you know, touch on, you know, you and your team a little bit as well. Um, to finish up the meeting, some not so popular yet effective, basically last ditch efforts. Um, buyer paid commission. Um, I'm starting to see this a little bit more and more where the uh the buyer's agent is sending over the cbc form saying hey we're not going to take a commission on this from the seller um, at that point the seller can choose to keep that in their pocket or maybe the listing agent keeps it as a bonus whatever their deal is is their deal but um you know some are asking the buyer to pay their commission now and a lot of the buyers are actually agreeing to it um, because that's more money in the seller's pocket. Um, it could be a little easier on the appraisal and stuff because you don't have to go as high on price potentially. Um, so that is something that's working out there. Again, obviously it's not quite as popular, but if you're in kind of a last ditch effort mode, that's something to think about. Um, listing agent bonus, again, um, sending over the CBC form and taking a, a commission reduction, maybe it's a couple thousand dollars or something uh, that, the, that the listing agent can keep in their pocket to maybe entice them um, to consider your offer over other similar competing offers. Um, that's something to think about. Maybe they pass that on to the seller as well. Again, we don't know what their agreement is, but basically it's a kicker to your offer. Um, and then, you know, Worst case scenario, you're about to lose the client. Maybe you put a referral agreement in place um, with the, the listing agent of a property that they want to offer on and see if you can just get, you know, maybe 25, 30% and have the, that listing agent do a double end on it. Obviously, they're going to be pretty motivated at that point. And if you're in jeopardy of losing your client because maybe you've offered on you know, six, seven, eight, ten homes, and they're just kind of getting exhausted at this, this point, and they're starting to get a little squirrely on you. Think about, you know, going that route as maybe the last ditch effort. So, um, again, I'm going to send out this, uh, this PDF so you can have it um, if you want to reference it again. But other than that, you know, if you guys have questions on anything, give me a call. I'm always around. Um, if you have questions now, you can throw them in chat or, you know, I think most of you are unmuted if you want to ask any questions. So, um, that'll kind of do it for the meeting. If anybody doesn't have any questions.